jump into uh, to Matthew's gospel here. Father, we do rejoice as we continue in our study of, of Matthew already having looked at the, the birth of Christ and, and in particular the, uh, the character of, of Joseph, the obedience of Joseph, as well as the, the grace that we see in, in the genealogy of, of Jesus, Lord. It's uh, overwhelming. God, as we now turn our thoughts to uh, the person of John the Baptist, a person with a, a unique ministry and a unique place in, in history, Lord, may we continue to uh, learn from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. In terms of, uh, again, our main character in chapter 3 is John the Baptist and who he was. We say that John was, uh, was the last of the Old Testament prophets. Uh, he's the, the guy that, in, in a sense, figuratively uh, stands at the end of what we call 400 years of silence when God has not spoken to uh, the people of Israel, either through a prophet or through the priest in the temple. And we'll mention one of those occasions uh, uh, when that silence ended this morning. But uh, he stands at the door now having heard from the Lord and actually seeing uh, the kingdom is open for business. Uh, the kingdom of God is at hand because the Messiah is, is ready to come on the scene. And he is the, as predicted by the prophets, there would be a, a forerunner that would come in and invite people into the kingdom of God. Now, what's again interesting about him is the fact that Jesus says of John the Baptist, there was none greater than John leading up to that point in time. Not Abraham, not Moses, not David, not Elijah, not Elisha, not Jeremiah, not Daniel. Uh, this is a pretty radical statement. How is it that John the Baptist, according to Jesus, is greater than all of them? I mean, Abraham, the father of our faith, Moses did all the miracles, led the people out. I think it's because of what we see here in, in chapter 3, because he plays a unique role in terms of the redemption of mankind because he is the forerunner of the, of the Messiah. And I've kind of broken uh, this chapter down into uh, four aspects of uh, the uniqueness or the purpose of John's ministry. And the first one is that John's purpose was to prepare the common people for the coming Messiah. John, uh, again, is, is out there, John the Baptist, ministering down in the Judean uh, wilderness, uh, and it's the common people that are coming to him. We'll also talk in a moment about the how uh, the, the corrupt leadership will come down as well. He doesn't exactly have nice things to say uh, about them. But for the common people, as we know in the ministry of Jesus, they heard him gladly. Let's take a look at the first six verses. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Uh, this is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the desert, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John clo clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. So, again, how he prepared them is uh, actually several ways. And the first, he prepared the common people in terms of the place of his message out there in the, in the desert itself. This is not exactly where John's parents would have uh, supposed he'd be doing a ministry because after all, remember, John had those Levi genes. I mean, he, his parents fully expected him to follow his father, Zachariah, be a priest, serve in the temple, and carry out the very honored, very traditional role. And this is anything but. Uh, the uh, user-friendly church uh, growth guys would never use John the Baptist as a model for, uh, for ministry. This is not exactly the, uh, the best place to try to draw a crowd, though there was thousands that came to him in the desert. Uh, it seems to not only be the place of the ministry, but where he had spent some time, given what he eats, his diet, and his, his clothing. He's not a city slicker, folks. <laughs> He's kind of one of these guys that can live out the wilderness and kind of make it out there. 
the desert uh, there is in that area is pretty bleak. Um, and John's out there. He's able to sustain himself, uh, really, I think, because of his relationship with the Lord. Uh, there's a great application for us. Sometimes we talk about how the Lord allows us to go into wilderness experiences, times in the desert, not uh, literally. Some of you guys spend some time in the desert, but uh, uh, figuratively, spiritually, in like John, who had a tremendous dependence upon the Lord, that's what it does for us. There's a real purifying that takes place when there's nothing left. You know, we can really fake it pretty well in the physical realm. The guys back in Jerusalem, they did a pretty good job. They wore the right garments. They said the right prayers. They offered the right sacrifices. And by all appearances, they appeared to be very spiritual as how you might judge them physically. Same way with us. You know, we can come to church. We can do the right things. We can say the right words. Uh, we can kind of fake it, you know, in the physical realm. It's, it's a lot easier. Spiritually, it's very difficult to fake it. Uh, and John was no fake. I mean, he's out there in the wilderness, in the desert, uh, totally dependent upon the Lord and uh, a very unique ministry uh, and a ministry that drew, obviously, uh, many, many people. Secondly, uh, he prepared the common people in terms of the timing in his message. Now, verse one just says, in those days. Uh, there was a lot going on in those days. And in John's gospel, chapter three, verse one, we have uh, information about who was in government and who was reigning spiritually. I've got that verse for you. It says, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod the Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, Tetrarch of uh, Eturia and Traconitus, and Lysanias, the Tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, Say that fast ten times. The word of the Lord came to John, son of Zechariah, in the desert. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Again, just two things briefly. Who's ruling at that time? Well, it's the second Caesar, Tiberius, having taken over from uh, Augustus. Uh, at that point in time in Rome, the, uh, the temple to uh, the god of war was closed down because they were experiencing what they called the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. The peace of Rome, that means they had bludgeoned everybody into submission uh, that was uh, in the known world to them at the time. So there was peace, uh, but peace at a price. And certainly that was the, in those days that John was ministering in terms of the oppression of the Roman Empire. Uh, also, we see that uh, it was in the time of Annas and Caiap Caiaphas being the high priest. Uh, many critics of the Bible used to point out to this and say, well, well, there's a conflict. You can't have two high priests. No, there was two. Again, the high priest was appointed by Rome. Annas was a high priest from 6 to 15 A.D., uh, he grew too powerful, so the Romans said, mm, that's too much power for you. They disposed him. He had five sons, chose none of them, but chose his son-in-law, Caiaphas, to become the high priest. So from Rome's, Rome's perspective, historically, Caiaphas is the high priest. From the Jewish people's perspective, the old man, Annas, is still the reigning high priest. When Jesus is arrested, they took him first to Annas and then later to, uh, to Caiaphas. But those high priests, which were, again, according to even Jewish historians, that leadership at that time was absolutely corrupt. They would, uh, were both Sadducees, and they would sit on the Sanhedrin, this council of elders made up of uh, Sadducees and Pharisees. We're going to meet them in a, in a moment. Didn't agree on many things theologically, but they both apparently agreed that they needed to do something about the ministry of John the Baptist, so they're sent out as an, uh, an official delegation. There was a group of rabbis that held to the word of God. The English translation, the Hebrew word slips in my mind, but the English translation is the council, uh, and the people did respect them because they, they held to the teaching of the word of God. But basically, uh, there was an oppressive political and military system over in those days, and there was a very corrupt spiritual atmosphere uh, of the people in those days, and there was one other element. Uh, and again, from our studies in Daniel, you can appreciate this as we studied about Antiochus Epiphany and his coming in during that time, bringing the Greek influence, sacrificing a pig on the altar, bringing Zeus in, and the other horrific things that we mentioned some of that time. And then uh, the Maccabean revolt against them and, uh, and able to, at least for a, a short period of time, they cleansed the temple and celebrated Hanukkah, and, uh, uh, and uh, Israel had a little bit of sovereignty for a brief period of time there. 
uh, because of that, because of that event, even though the Romans came in, but because of that wasn't that long ago in their history, the people are still thinking, if the Messiah comes, we can do this again. You know, we, we kind of had our sovereignty. Uh, these guys are ruling over us again. It hasn't been that long. The scriptures say, and so there was an anticipation of the Messiah come in those days. So a short little phrase, but it kind of is charged with what was going on in terms of government spiritually and an anticipation by the people. So when John says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near, they're thinking messianic kingdom based on the scriptures and the people are coming out again by, by the thousands. Uh, thirdly, we see that he prepared the common people in his message, which was that of, uh, of repentance. And uh, often we hear the phrase repentance and, and maybe kind of misunderstand what it means. And it certainly means uh, often it, 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 our behavior has changed. We used to do this and now we do this instead because we've repented. But it literally means to change our mind or to completely change our mind and to complete, change our thinking. We change our thinking then that's what changes our behavior. Uh, the way we came to faith in Christ is because we repented. Uh, we may not have believed in God, and the Bible says uh, God's the creator of the heavens and the earth. We changed our mind, and we believed in that. We recognized that. It says that I'm a sinner. I've, uh, in my own self, I, I've sinned. I've transgressed against God's law. Before, I thought I was a pretty good person, but now I've repented. I changed my mind. I realized that uh, I'm a pretty rotten guy after all, <laughs> especially when I look in the light of what God's word says and his law and uh, in the perfection of, of Jesus Christ. Uh, the Bible says that, that Jesus Christ uh, is the only propitiation. He's the only one that has really died for my sins. His blood is the only blood that can cleanse me, forgive me, and give me eternal life. And maybe at one time I didn't really believe that, but God's word said it, and then I changed my thinking and I believed it. Now that, that then caused some other outward changes in my life, but repentance, the main thing to keep in mind is it's a change in my mind, it's a change in my thinking, and uh, again, in the, uh, to put a plug in on the Truth Project on Wednesday night, as we're sitting in a Christian worldview, there's some repenting going on because we're, we're seeing some things and go, that's what the Bible says, and here's how I think on that particular subject, and now I need to repent, have my thinking agree with the Bible. So it's how we come to know the Lord, but it's how we continue to change as well. I read my Bible daily. We read our Bibles daily, and as we do, we come across a verse that says, do this or don't do this. Oh, I'm not really doing that. Okay, Lord, I repent. I change my mind. I change my thinking. I pray that you would do a work in me. I'm willing, Lord. Uh, your spirit can empower me to change me so that my behavior matches my repentance because that is pr the, what predicates or comes before, as John says, forgiveness of sins. So important that, uh, uh, that, we, that we change. I was <laughs> talking to one of the guys in the hall uh, er earlier, and he was talking about uh, how much he's enjoying the, the, the Truth Project and so forth, and it's helping him, especially as he kind of shares with some folks uh, uh, and family members and everything that uh, kind of have more of a, uh, what we'd call a, a new age or a secular humanist point of view uh, of things in the world and everything, but yet, but yet have some Christian background and claim to know Christ and so forth. He's able to dialogue with them a little more. And he says that the big influence over their lives was uh, early on and back in the late 60s, early 70s, get, getting in a, a kind of a new age, kind of a quasi-psychology group called EST or Earhart uh, uh, training uh, seminars and so forth. And, uh, and they've, they've had to change their name and as they kind of move from state to state and they get lawsuits against them for false advertising, practicing psychology without a license and a number of other things, they kind of change their names and move on. But uh, uh, there was a guy that was a, a trainer in one of those groups and, uh, and he allegedly became a Christian. So then he took this new age uh, quasi-psychological training and gave it Christian terminology instead of playing rock music, played Christian rock music, said a poetry, read psalms, incorporate some Christian terminology into this weekend and then started teaching it throughout churches. But it was still the, the secular humanist view of man, of God, and, uh, and, and so forth. Well, what happened? Well, that guy never repented he never changed his thinking about his, his, uh, his behavior. <laughs> I, I read an article one time about a, a guy back in the uh, 40s who was kind of a, a well-known gangster that went to a, 
uh, a crusade, a large crusade, and went forward and, and prayed. And it was interviewed later, and he said, yeah, I, you know, I, 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 want, I wanted to know God. You know, I wanted to be forgiven of my, my sin and so forth. And, and uh, I heard some testimonies of Christian athletes. I heard some testimonies of Christian businessmen, so I thought it could be a, a Christian gangster. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> That's not, that's not, this is a true story, but that's not, that's not repentance. Uh, but that was the, the message that John, as he prepared the common people for the coming uh, of Jesus Christ. Now, some would say that, uh, uh, well, that was the message of John, but was it the message of Jesus? Yeah, if you look, one of the first messages of Jesus, repent, he says the same thing. Peter's first message, how he starts, Acts 3, repent. The Apostle Paul, then when he's speaking to a Gentile crowd, one of the few sermons that we have that he's not in a synagogue setting is in Acts 17. Uh, he's in, up on Mars Hill there in, in Greece to the intellectuals of the day. He's talking about all the idols that were in that, uh, that city. And he's saying, I'm here to tell you about the, uh, the one that's to the unknown God and, and so forth. And he kind of does his little segue into their lives, thinking and culturally and so forth. And then, uh, and then says this, this statement in his sermon in verse 29 of chapter 17. Uh, Therefore, since we're God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by man's design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. I think that about covered it. All people everywhere. Uh, For he has said a day when he will judge the world with justice By the man he is appointed, he's given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. Very important ministry. How is John greater than all those prophets? He had a unique ministry. Uh, As he is there to announce the coming kingdom, he prepared the common people for uh, the the preaching of the cross that would come later. And uh, he does that in terms of time and place and message. Uh, and certainly another aspect of that message is that he was preaching of, uh, of the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is among you, Jesus said. And, uh, and Jesus said that uh, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born again. Uh, Jesus talked a lot about the kingdom in Matthew because it's a very Jewish subject. They're expecting the Messiah to come and set up his kingdom. Again, they're looking for an earthly kingdom uh, which, which uh, from our prophecy conference, other studies, we know that, that Jesus will come and set up that, what we call his messianic kingdom one day. Uh, they just weren't looking for a suffering servant. Now, John, in his ministry, uh, is the, uh, the fulfillment, Matthew says, of Isaiah's prophecy, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John was coming along. Uh, and that, that's the way what they did. If a king was coming, they tried to make the paths straight, take all the bins out, pot, you know, patch up the holes, and get ready because the king is coming. I, I was in uh, several years ago in, in Madras, India, and uh, Mike Singel and I had gone uh, outside uh, to kind of a village area, uh, and we're uh, uh, doing a couple of nights of evangelism out there by one of, with one of the local churches, and uh, it was uh, it was very very interesting. I mean, and it was amazing with just a couple of fluorescent lights and a little stage and and somewhat of a worship band. How you could uh, quickly draw a crowd of, of of several hundred, of three or four hundred. You know, it's like, do we go back and light our candle? <laughs> or do we do it tonight, you know, the family says, or we go down where the music and the lights are? Drew a lot of people. It was amazing. And, uh, but, uh, and, and it was great, you know, uh, uh, preaching there a couple of nights. But I was talking to one of the drivers because we, we'd gotten there early and guys were all out on the road patching, uh, filling the holes because the, the roads there are, are not the best. It's kind of like four-wheel driving everywhere you go. You kind of have to hang on, you know, because, you know, you're just, you're hitting potholes all the time. And, uh, and these guys were out filling in holes and, and kind of improving the roads and putting up all these decorations. And I asked, uh, what's going on? They said, oh, in three days, the prime minister will come right through here down this road. They were preparing the way for the king, in a sense. Uh, well, Isaiah said there's going to be one that comes that, and he's going to do that figuratively uh, for, for the Messiah. John did that in terms of his ministry. We see he had prepared the common people also by the impact uh, upon their lives. And 
As I said before, I mean, where he is is not on the way to anywhere. <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, way out in the wilderness, in the Judea wilderness. And there's not like a few people coming by for a Bible study once in a while. Uh, it says that all the people from Jerusalem and all Judea, I mean, the whole region, they're coming. There are thousands of people coming out to hear John preach. And that's a tremendous impact. And what were they, were they doing on their part? Certainly they were hearing the message, they were accepting it, they were changing their thinking, and they were repenting of their sins. Now it's interesting, well, what did they have to repent of? Well, uh, <clears throat> Luke chapter 3 verse 10 tells us, they say to John in verse 10, uh, what should we uh, do then? The crowd asked. John answered, the man with two tunics should share with him who has none. And the one who has food should do the same. Uh, that's, you know, they, they were being a bit selfish. This was the terrible sin that they were repenting from. A tax collector also came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you're required to, he told them. So these are the guys from Wall Street coming out. And then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? And he replied, don't exhort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content uh, with your pay, which uh, Roman soldiers were known not to be too content with what Rome was paying, given the fact that they're out there risking their, uh, their lives every day. Basically, in terms of what was going on here, John is saying all believers should share with one another. If we should not be able to be content and be satisfied if somebody else uh, is in need. Uh, to be generous, to be, to be giving. Uh, he tells the uh, men and women to be, uh, uh, have integrity on their jobs, which the tax collectors didn't. As you know, they, they had to raise a certain amount every month, anything over the top of that they could keep for themselves, and they were becoming wealthy. And these tax collectors were coming out and repenting and go, what should we do? And they said, hey, have some integrity. Take what you're supposed to, collect the tax, turn it over, uh, and uh, have some integrity. And that uh, certainly uh, would go for us as well. To the soldier, uh, he basically says, be a good one, and then don't take advantage of, uh, of your position. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I, I remember uh, reading a Chuck Colson article a number of years ago just talking about the, the distinct difference between the military in the United States versus other countries. He says, typically, whether you're in the jungles of Nicaragua or you're somewhere in the Middle East, when a bunch of 18 and 19-year-olds run into your town, your village, carrying automatic weapons, most people are scared to death. And they hide their women and their children and any values that they, that they might have around. And there's an exception to that, is if those men and women have a little patch on their sleeve of the United States flag, then they can be relieved and know that nobody's going to rip them off, nobody's going to harass them, these are the guys here to rescue us. And it's been, <laughs> been true all these years, and certainly it's true again today. That comes from this idea, this teaching. Do what we do. Do it with in integrity. Uh, don't impose. You know, you have an uh, automatic weapon gives you a lot of authority. But, but uh, our guys, our gals live under a system of discipline and authority that uh, we, we don't hear a lot about. Rules of engagement for them is very, very difficult. They have to risk their lives put their own guys at risk in order to file, follow a certain set of rules of engagement that are very difficult. And they do it. And they do it. And it's an uh, amazing thing. It goes back, whether they know it or not, they're all being good Christians. <laughs> they're following this ethic laid out right here by John the Baptist. Amen? <laughs> John's purpose was to prepare the common people for the coming Messiah. Secondly, John's purpose was to prepare the corrupt leadership for the coming Messiah. We've mentioned that. Let's look at it in verses 7 to 10. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptized, and he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do you not think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees. Every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. So uh, there's a, a contrasting uh, here. Uh, as he begins verse 7, the but. This is what it was like in terms of how he uh, you know, addressed the common people. Uh, again, that heard him and Jesus gladly. Uh, but the contrast now is what he has to say to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So secondly, John's purpose was to prepare this corrupt leadership for the coming Messiah. We see he does that uh, in the warning. 
Uh, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? There's two thoughts in mind, and one is the, the short term, the 70 AD destruction of Jerusalem that these guys literally, uh, for the most part, would have died in. But there's certainly a greater wrath than that, and that's the wrath of hell. Uh, <clears throat> They thought, we know from history, we know from their comments that uh, basically they believed because they were born Jewish, they would go to heaven. That's all that was required. If you weren't, you weren't. That, that was their prevailing thought. Of course, they wanted to appear and be, uh, have a higher position in terms of the religious establishment and the power that came with this. And that's why they uh, become part often, not all of them, but many of them of the Pharisees or the Sadducees. But here John is, is warning them as, as well. Uh, hey, who warned you to flee the coming wrath? In other words, there is a coming wrath. Who warned you? I mean, they're out there as an official delegation sent by the Sanhedrin. Uh, and they're out there to find out what is going on with, uh, with John. And uh, keep in mind the fact that, that uh, uh, they would have known John well. These guys all went to Punahou together. Right? I mean, they grew up together. John's got the Levi genes. His dad's a priest. He's coming to Jerusalem to do his thing. He's coming with them. These guys grew up together. They were the spiritual elite. John was part of that. And at some point in time, he says, this ain't happening. <laughs> and and I, I was super, but he knows that he's supernaturally born. He knows the story of his father uh, going into the altar of incense. Uh, he knows that his dad's, you know, doing his thing. Uh, maybe once in your life as a priest, again, the priests are divided in 24 courses, divided up and two times a year. They would come in and, and work for a period of time, a couple of weeks there in, in the temple proper and so forth. And maybe in your lifetime, your lot might be drawn so you get to be the priest that goes in that morning to burn incense before the altar of God. Not in the holy of holies, but in the holy place. Zechariah, as you know, gets his lot is drawn. So once in a lifetime, he goes in. And of course, <laughs> by the way, he's lighting the incense. He's saying a ritualistic prayer, part of which contains the idea. And, and, uh, and, and we pray and expect to hear from you, God. And, but they're not really expecting because God hadn't spoke to anybody in 400 years. So it's kind of a long time to hang out and keep thinking it's going to happen. But then it happens to John, right? The angel comes and, and tells him uh, that he's going to be the father, name him John, all that stuff. All that goes on and he comes out then, and the biggest event in, in Jewish history in 400 years, he's part of it, and his wife wants to know what's going on, and he can't say a word. That would be a little tough on a marriage, you know. But uh, anyway, uh, God has a sense of humor. Uh, you know, I'm sure he communicates all that. John is aware of his heritage, and at some point in time, again, he leaves and departs. His parents are elderly when he's born. They're, they're, they're long, you know, off the scene at this point. And he's out there. These guys come out to confront him because there's thousands coming to him. And they're saying, are you the Messiah? And he's saying, no, no, I'm not. But he's saying, but I better warn you guys. And he, he warns them in terms of the, uh, the illustration he uses as well. The ax is already laid at the root. That means the tree's about ready to, uh, to cut down. You don't take an ax and slam it into the, <laughs> the bottom of a tree for its health uh, to spur growth. It's because it's, uh, it's coming down. And so he, he warns them uh, of the coming Messiah and what it's going to mean to them as well if they don't produce fruit in keeping with repentance. It's the same. Uh, these guys can get saved. These guys can come to know the Lord, and some of them did. Some of them did. Many of the Pharisees came to the Lord. That's why it created a little bit of problem in the early church. These guys are just a little bit legalistic, you know, <laughs> given their background. And, uh, and, and we have the discussions over that uh, in, early on in the book of Acts. But again, John's purpose is unique, greatest among the Old Testament prophets because he prepared the common people as well as the corrupt leaders and then he draws the contrast between his ministry and the ministry of the coming Messiah, and that's in verses 11 to 12. He says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry, some translations would say, or to loose or untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat, into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So 
<laughs> this is the second contrasting term that, uh, that he uses, but after me will come. Compared to me, compared to what I do, here's a tremendous contrast compared to what the Messiah is going to be like. He's going to be so much more powerful uh, than I am. Uh, our ministries are, are so different. He says, I baptize you with water for the remission of your sins, but he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and, uh, and with, with fire. Uh, he says, again, his ministry is so much more powerful uh, than I. And uh, again, this is the John the Baptist that said when his disciples were gathered around him as Jesus walked by, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Uh, he recognizes and designates to them that Jesus is the Messiah, the Messiah that would die for our sins, and then says, and I must decrease and he must increase. That's a good preacher <laughs> that, that is trying to always point people away from himself into Jesus Christ. And there's uh, another statement here that uh, we'll see the tremendous humility besides that statement uh, in John's uh, life. Two thoughts to this idea of I baptize with water, but he will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Because of the next illustration, He's got his winnowing fork in his hand. He's going to throw up the chaff and so forth, and they're going to be burned with unquenchable fire. Uh, some would see that as Jesus is going to come, and compared to me, he's going to come and baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire in terms of judgment. But uh, I, I really think that the tie-in is with Acts 2. I baptize with water, uh, and, and, and you're saying I have a need to be forgiven. I need the Messiah. You know, I need a sacrifice for my sins. We'd say John's ministry is all pre-evangelism. Uh, people need to see that they need a Savior before they'll turn to a Savior. And, and John is, uh, is um, carrying out that ministry very well. Uh, but uh, Jesus comes along, dies for our sins, and then in Acts 2, the Holy Spirit is, is poured out. Acts 1, 8, as disciples are saying to him, uh, and, and, and by the way, when are you coming back? When are you going to set up your kingdom? And he kind of says, but, <laughs> can I interrupt you here for a moment? But the Holy Spirit shall be upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. Uh, 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 the Holy Spirit shall come upon you with power, and you shall be my witnesses, both here in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other most parts of the world. Jesus says the Holy Spirit's going to come and give you the power to do what you can't do in and of yourselves. I, I like the classic Billy Graham live line uh, uh, that I, I've heard him say many times over the years, watching him on television. He says, and I, I can't do a good, uh, I should be able to, but I can't do a good North Carolina Billy Graham accent. But uh, nonetheless, he says, living the Christian life is impossible. And then he opens his coat. Unless you have the Holy Spirit in your heart. The Holy Spirit is what enables us to live the Christian life. John says, my ministry compared to that of, of Jesus is a complete contrast. I can do pre-evangelism, but not only is he going to be the one to really forgive sins completely, he's going to give you the ability then to live the life he wants you to live and the life that you'll want to live uh, as a Christian as well. So again, tremendous contrast uh, between the two. And then thirdly, uh, this what would be considered a shocking statement, a contrast in their position. He says, I'm not uh, worthy to carry his sandals or not worthy to untie his sandals. John, as an itinerant rabbi, would have had his disciples. Jesus, as an itinerant rabbi, would have had his disciples as well. And it's a, it's a whole official deal. They kind of come along first as wannabes, and everything, which we, we see, we'll see that early on in the Gospels. And then, and then there has to be a, an, an, an official, you know, declaration by that teacher, by that rabbi, that you can come be my disciples, which we, we see with Jesus, with Peter and John, and so forth. He'll, at some point in time, he'll say, you know, come follow me. And then they have to decide whether they're going to lay down their nets, their livelihood, and everything else, and basically go live with him, travel with him, and part of that was be his servant, learn from him, be his disciple for the next how many years? Well, even if you did that, the one thing you would never be asked to do would be to, although you're supposed to be his servant at that point, the one thing you would never be asked to do would be to untie his sandals. <laughs> because, I mean, that's the lowest of the lowest servant would, would do that. So John says, take the lowest of the lowest of the lowest servant, and he says, I'm not even worthy for that in terms of Jesus' ministry to mine. That would have been a very shocking statement uh, to them given the fact that 
John's got the biggest church in town right then. You know, I mean, he's got the thousands. Uh, he's not following a great church growth, growth plan. He's got a, kind of a radical, nasty message, man, just calling people broods of vipers and stuff. And I doubt if he even had much television coverage. But uh, nonetheless, got, he's got the biggest show in town. He says, and I'm nothing. I mean, I'm lower than the lowest of the low compared to the one that is coming after me. And that's part of his ministry. He's drawing a tremendous contrast in himself uh, in uh, Jesus that would come. And then, uh, again, in that illustration, uh, John uses something that uh, is very familiar, the idea of the winnowing fork in his hands. Uh, Psalm 1 uh, says that um, uh, the wicked are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. And it's uh, something they would have been familiar with. You, you know the story. They would bring their, harvest their grain, just like they, they do today in, in a lot of places around the world. They would need to uh, crush it, and they would do that by, by walking on it and stomping it, breaking open the, the rice or the grain that would, uh, that would then come out, those kernels, and then they would do it on a high area that would catch a breeze, and they would take the winnowing fork, pitch it up in the air. The chaff, which is lighter, blows away. The grain, which is heavier, drops to the ground. Watch them do it in, in India. They, <laughs> they throw it on the roads and drive over it with tractors. And they do, they do the same thing. They, they pitch it up and stuff. And it's like, wow, it's like in the Bible. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of stuff like that <laughs> in India. But uh, that's what's going on here. But John, John takes that illustration a little further. And he says, by the way, did I mention that you guys are the chaff? And as it blows, it's going to unquenchable fire like you're going to burn forever. Did I mention that part? So I've got this ministry here, and I'm doing what I can, but the one coming after me is way more powerful. I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. I baptize with water. You can go to baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Uh, and, and if there's not a repentance and a receiving and a changing of your minds and your thinking, then you'll end up lightweight <laughs> and just kind of blowing in, in the wind as far as, as opposed to having some real substance to your life and, and your eternity. So John prepares the common people, deals with the corrupt, makes the contrast between his ministry and the coming Messiah. And then fourth, John's purpose was to prepare the Messiah for an important confirmation. And we see this in what we call the baptism of Jesus in verse 13 to 17. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so for now. Uh, it is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. There's uh, several confirmations that are going on here that are uh, very important. Some of them have uh, some real good application to us. And the first one is uh, the baptism confirmed to John the true identity of Jesus. Now, again, John and Jesus were cousins. They didn't exactly live down the street from each other, though. Remember Mary, after she uh, <coughs> receives this revelation from the angels, she'll be the mother of the Messiah, that she's pregnant. She takes a, a little journey to go visit Elizabeth because the angel is set in confirmation to her. Elizabeth, who is beyond the age of having children, uh, is now, you know, several months pregnant. And Mary goes down, and, and then in Luke, we have this beautiful scene of these two gals coming together, the songs that are sung, and, and, and the whole episode of, of John the Baptist leaping in her womb when, uh, when Mary comes on the scene and, and her voice is, is heard. Uh, so these guys, uh, John the Baptist... Uh, would have known who Jesus was. It's his cousin. Again, he doesn't live close by, but it's his cousin. He certainly would know the story of his own heritage. You know, if you're the guy, first time 400 years, God speaks to you, you might mention that to your kid once in a while. You just might, especially when his birth was a, a miracle. Did I mention that to you, son? I think God wants to use you. Did I mention, you know, I'm, I'm sure this was a, a, a topic of conversation daily in, in their home. And did I mention the part about Mary and who she, your cousin Jesus? Did I mention that he's the Messiah? <laughs> Might want to keep an eye on him. He would know the whole story. 
of them coming to Bethlehem, uh, of the angels appearing in the sky, the shepherds coming in. Uh, they would have known about the Magi coming. They would have known about the flight to Egypt. They would have known God directing uh, Joseph in a dream. Everything that we knew, certainly they knew and they knew more. Would this be a hot topic conversation or what in this home? John knows all of that, and he knows that Jesus is his cousin, and he comes on the scene, but we also know from another passage of Scripture that John needed some confirmation and was told that when you see a dove descend upon him as the Holy Spirit, you know he's the one. Now Jesus, he comes and, he's, and John's like, you know, he, he knows all that, so when Jesus says, I want you to baptize, he's like, no way, <laughs> you baptize me. And he's, no, no, we, we need to do this to fulfill all righteousness. And, um, and, and Jesus does this, he submits to this. Do he have any sins to be forgiven? No, and we're going to see the confirmation of that in a moment. But Peter tells us he does it as, a, as an example, 1 Peter 2.21. Uh, Peter says, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. We're to follow in his steps. He left us an example. Jesus did not need to be baptized, but to fulfill all righteousness lays out an example for us so that we too would be baptized. Doesn't save anybody, but it again shows that we are saved, a public declaration uh, of our, our faith. So it's confirmation to John, now that he knows that he knows that he knows. Why was that important? Again, because John was not politically correct. He didn't exactly pull any punches. Like when the king goes by, you're an adulterer, God's going to judge you. That doesn't you know, go over real big in a, in a military-occupied land where they can do anything they want to do, and they do. John's arrested, you know, and, and eventually he's, you know, the story, he's beheaded. He's martyred for his faith. Uh, it, It'd be nice to know. You know what I mean? It's like, you ever do something for the Lord and you think, okay, Lord, I'm really trusting you, but a little confirmation would be really good right now. You know, uh, that's where John's at. I mean, he knows, he knows all of that. But what he's being asked to do, what he's involved in is such epic proportions. The greatest prophet among men, none born a woman greater than John, according to Jesus. It's like the Lord comes and brings him confirmation. I, I just think that's great because I think the Lord is... Faithful to do that when we really need it as, as well. And that leads into the, uh, the second point is that it, it did confirm. It identified who the Messiah was. For sure it's Jesus. But this idea of Jesus coming and saying, baptize me to John. Wow. Would that be an, an honor? Would that kind of make your day or something? I mean, you understand. You realize what's going on. I... Um, it's nice, it's nice to have that, <laughs> that confirmation that you're on drag with the Lord, you know, once in a while. It's great when a verse leaps off the page, you know, and, and hey, God does love me. He cares for me. We're, we're doing, doing well. It's just great to have. I, uh, several years ago, we'd only been doing the church for a couple of three years maybe, and uh, we had a young Marine couple that come be part of the church, Jack and Shelly, uh, and he was a helicopter pilot. It was neat to... Uh, just see him grow in the Lord. He was kind of not sure. He was one of those guys that was coming because his wife was dragging him. But, but, but he played softball with this. And by the end of the season, he was one of the boys. And then he just came for everything and totally grew uh, in the three years he was with us. And then went on to uh, Camp David to fly the president at that time, which was uh, pretty cool. Uh, but he, he showed up that first day went in the back to meet him. And they were from Pendleton. So they were going to uh, Calvary Costa Mesa. Uh, and he said, oh, we're glad we found you, you know, because Pastor Chuck told us to find your, your church here and, and, stare, and plug in with you guys. Oh, oh, that's great. Hey, praise the Lord. Chuck told you to find a Calvary Chapel in Hawaii. That's terrific. No, he said to look for Calvary Chapel one word and to find you so we could plug in here. Pastor Chuck that said Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa said that? Yeah, Pastor Chuck. Yeah, we were just there last week. And he said to me, wow, that kind of made my day, week, and probably several months. You know, <laughs> you go to these pastors' conferences, there's 1,200 senior pastors there. I mean, you're kind of a dot in the crowd. Uh, it was very confirming. Uh, that was, uh, I should put that quote on our website, maybe. What do you think? <laughs> Recommended by Pastor Chuck. <laughs> uh, John's ministry is confirmed. It, it had to be a blessing 
to, to John. I mean, in terms of, he kind of had to know where he was headed with all of this. Uh, and it had to be a, a blessing to him. Uh, the, the other thing here is the baptism confirms to Jesus that the Father's uh, well pleased. He goes into the water. Uh, the text says the heavens are open. Time-space continuum, as we know it, is kind of split. And, uh, and that which is infinite is able to reach into the time-space continuum that we live in and speak audibly to, to Jesus at, at that point. Now, it happens on a few other occasions, the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, we have a similar kind of episode uh, that takes place. Uh, there's several things that are uh, important about this. And, and one is the fact that we see the Holy Spirit descend upon Jesus as a dove in the shape of, uh, of a dove and so forth. And uh, it wasn't the dove of world peace. Uh, a dove is a, a sacrificial animal that speaks of purity. Uh, so between the symbol that is chosen, the Holy Spirit could have showed up like anything, right? You know, But because of the symbol that's used and what the, God the Father says of Jesus, it tells us something very important. Sometimes people say, well, what happened to Jesus? You know, and we see him as a, he gets bar mitzvah, he goes to Jerusalem, and he starts to do his three, three feasts a year like everybody else, all good Jewish boys. <clears throat> but he hangs in the temple, his parents go back because they're in a caravan, a big entourage of people. They get somewhere out of town. I thought he was with uncle so-and-so or auntie so No, he's not here. So they go back and Jesus is in there confounding the, the elders, which was a fulfillment of prophecy uh, also, by the way. And then we don't really hear anything else about Jesus until now when he begins his, his ministry. Well, what was going on during that time? I can tell you exactly what was going on during that time. He was living a life of absolute purity, holiness, and obedience to the Lord. That's what this says. The purity of the dove, the voice. This is my son in whom I am completely well pleased. And, and that's, what, that's really all we need to know about the life of Jesus uh, during that, that time period. Was he going around as a little kid going, butterfly? No, he, he, wasn't, he, was, he was just doing regular kid stuff, man. He gives people some very strange stories about what Jesus did in, in his childhood. What he was doing was, was obeying the, the word of God. And, uh, and uh, the other thing that's important here is we see the Trinity, the Father speaking, the Son being baptized, the Holy Spirit in the form of the dove. The other aspect of, of Jesus being what we might say being baptized in the Holy Spirit at this time is to realize what's coming next in chapter 4. Some pretty big time spiritual warfare, the temptation of Christ uh, from Satan, not the, but a, a series of temptations in which Jesus, and we'll look at it next week, defeats Satan using the word of God. But we need to see the model, the example. Here's Jesus, born of the Spirit. Over, the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary. Certainly we could say Jesus is born of the Spirit. Baptized in the Spirit with the word of God is able to have a victorious life over the temptations of the enemy. Does that sound very familiar? Those of us that are born of God's Spirit, baptized in God's Spirit, if we'll take in God's word into our hearts and minds, then we can overcome the temptations of the enemy. And that's what we'll look at in, in great detail next week. Let's pray. Father, we do rejoice in, in the ministry of, of John the Baptist, and he, he did it well, and it cost him all. But uh, I'm sure great is his reward with you, uh, with you now. Living a life behind in Jerusalem of power, of prestige that he could have had as a son of, of Levi or Levi. He, but he, he saw that as pretentious. He recognized the corruption. Uh, he recognized a, a spiritual heritage uh, given to him and, and, and had a sense of what his life was to be all about and obedience to you. And, and what a contrast between the uh, the beauty of Jerusalem, the beauty of the temple, the glory that was there in terms of the grandeur to live a life in, in the desert and just be one of those guys that can, uh, the mountain man guy, the guy that can live off, off the land. And, uh, and what a bleak existence, but in that, so dependent upon you, so trusting uh, in you. And then when you were ready, when the time came, how you tremendously used him. And then the wonderful confirmation of Jesus being baptized by him. And now we see the Lord 
from this occasion, now ready to begin his ministry. Lord, so we pray that you'd continue to teach us and make us like Jesus as we study the life of Jesus in Matthew's gospel. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.
fall on my left leg. I'm holding on 